Hey guys, Wave Nunley here with Bible Unplugged. Welcome back to our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Today we're going to be looking at Jesus' words, His instructions on benevolence. He talks about beware of practicing your righteousness before men. Exactly what does that mean and how does it fit into the big context of the larger passage? So in Matthew chapter 6, we hear Jesus' words, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Um, that's kind of an interesting take because earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So which is it? Uh, your works should be done and seen by other people or not? Well, that's a, a good reason for us to dive deeper into, to study a little bit more carefully this passage in its original context. So let us go to the original, um, the, the literal meaning of Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Um, beware of practicing your righteousness uh, before men. It, literally translated, we get this. Take heed of the righteousness of yours to not do. Um, uh, not, it's, it doesn't have to do with practicing. It's actively doing something. Um, to not do your righteousness in front of men for the purpose of it being beheld. So Jesus is really getting at a, a motivation, a kind of an attitudinal thing going on inside of us. Are we doing this for the purpose of showing off in front of other people as opposed to are people watching our lives and we're just going about it without any intentionality of impressing people or bringing people under condemnation or whatever and they just happen to notice how we're living our lives and they say, yeah, that's... That's the way that I want to live my life. That's the healthy way. That's the way, the, the, the approach to abundant life. That's the way that God approves. And then beginning to live like that because they see that in us. It's two different, differently motivated uh, attitudes there. But there's more to it. When, when Jesus says, um, beware of practicing, literally doing your righteousness before men, um, what, does he talk about any kind of, does he, mean, does he mean any sort of righteous act that we do? For example, in Jesus' world, burying the dead was a very important um, commandment or mitzvah that all should engage in. Is he talking about everything in life, practicing your righteousness? And the answer to that is no. Um, uh, the word as Jesus uses the word righteousness is a technical term and it's a code word within first century Judaism in the land of, uh, of Israel. The Hebrew word is tzedakah. Uh, it literally means righteousness but has come to mean the, um, the, uh, the giving of our means in order to help someone that we find in need. So we find, for example, in the early rabbis, in one of the earliest collections called the Tosefta, in the tractate that's called Pe'ah, um, or the edges of the field, uh, of, of your um, sown and harvested field. Tzedakah, or righteousness, is given, something that you give to someone, only to poor people, since help with finances can only be with money. So it's a very specific point of reference that Jesus is ad addressing here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your piety. It's really beware of, of doing your um, benevolent giving um, is another way of, uh, of rendering this. The word tzedakah means righteousness, literally, but is, it has come to be code for um, benevolent giving. Here's another rabbinic text. There is a story of a certain um, ultra-pious person, a certain Hasid, who would regularly notice the word do. It's the same verb that Jesus uses. So when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, the very uh, language that he is using, the word choice that he's using is excellent uh, contemporary Hebrew that people that were in his audience would have 
understood immediately. Be, uh, the, the certain uh, ultra-righteous, pious person was regularly doing tzedakah, meaning giving alms, doing um, a benevolent giving. One time, this guy's boat sank into the sea. Well, Rabbi Akiva, very prominent rabbinic figure in the late first century, early second century, saw that happen, the guy sinking in the sea. Before he had a chance to get up where, from where he was sitting, that very man came in and stood in front of him. Akiva said, who brought you up out of the sea? The man who had sunk into the sea replied, the tzedakah that I did, notice the verb is to you do tzedakah. It's not give, it's to do. Who did tzedakah, I'm the one who did this tzedakah, and that's what brought me up out of the sea. And I heard a voice coming from the roar of the waves saying, Come, and let us raise this man up from the sea because he did, again the verb is, is consistent, it's regular here, did tzedakah all of his life because tzedakah saves from death, a quote from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 2. You always have to have a Bible passage to play the game in the world of first century Judaism. Here's another rabbinic text. Happy are those who do tzedakah. Notice again, we've a different text, different group of people talking, but it's the same kind of language. The verb to do and then with the noun tzedakah. It's not to give um, uh, benevolence offerings, it's to do righteousness. At all... At, Happy are those who do righteousness, tzedakah, at all times, Psalm 106. But is it possible to do tzedakah at all times? Is one always in the presence of the poor? Notice the connection between the, the, the tzedakah and the poor. Then the doing of tzedakah to the poor. It's the giving of benevolent uh, funds in order to help someone who is in, finds himself, uh, themselves in need. So, Jesus says, to continue the thought, Matthew 6, 1, beware of practicing or doing your tzedakah before men. Um, and then Jesus says, therefore, connected to what went before, the verse we've been studying, therefore, when you give, but the word is not give. The word is um, poies, to do. That's the original Greek. Of the, of the phrase in the Gospel of Matthew. Therefore, when you do alms, that, what, the, what he's meaning by that is tzedakah. The Hebrew behind this word elemosunes in Greek is the Hebrew tzedakah. When you do tzedakah, do not sound a trumpet before you. And so the word therefore is connecting to verse 1. It's telling you this passage is helping us to understand the previous passage. Verse 2 the giving of alms. It's very clear here in the Greek as well as the Hebrew that would belie the Greek that we're talking about alms giving back over in verse 1, the one that we've been dealing with. In Matthew chapters six, uh, uh, chapter 6, verses four, 3 and 4, Jesus has another place where He deals with this matter of alms giving. And He says, when you give, when you give, that is literally do, when you do alms, don't let your right hand know what your left hand know what your right hand is doing, in order that your alms may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will repay you. So we know that we're on the right track connecting this matter of doing righteousness in verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, with the, uh, I, the, the, the Jewish practice of tzedakah. The word is literally righteousness, but it's, um, in this context it means a specific act of righteousness, that is, giving to those who are in need. How do we know that? We know that two ways. One is that that's the way that that word is being used in the first century in the land of Israel because we saw it in the works of the rabbis. Another way that we can check that is in verses 2, 3, and 4, we have specific references in the Greek New Testament, and it comes through in English, that specifically refers to alms. And it is, there are always these connectors. 
In verse 2, it was therefore. In verses six, 3 and 4, it's but. So there's a connection to something that's gone ahead of it, before it. That, that, there is verse 1. Um, now, this business of almsgiving is a really interesting practice because if you'll look in a concordance or just read the whole Old Testament if you have time, um, you'll find that the word alms or almsgiving or the giving of alms is never once referred to, not one time, zero times in the Old Testament that does this phrase show up. And yet we find it all over the place in um, places like the Sermon on the Mount, in Jesus' teaching. Uh, so then where does that come from? How do we get to almsgiving that becomes such a prominent feature of Jesus' teaching um, and, and practice as well when we find no um, antecedent, we, no reference to that, uh, no foundation or grounding in the Old Testament? Well, what we do have in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament in Leviticus 19, again in chapter 23, in Deuteronomy 24, and all over the place in Ruth ch chapter 2 is a practice called gleaning. Um, so we find Ruth, for example, gleaning in the fields of Boaz. She was picking up uh, wheat kernels, barley kernels, that were being left behind by Boaz's reapers. Um, we're also told in these passages in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, if you forget a sheaf uh, of wheat, a big old bundle of wheat that's tied together, then don't go back to, um, to pick it up and bring it with you. Let it, leave it alone. Let it alone and leave it there in the field for the gleaners, for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the alien, the non-Israelite that lives among you. What was, the, what was the reason for all of this legislation, all of these expectations or requirements in the Torah of Moses, the Law of Moses? Well, the expectation was that as God has blessed His covenant people, they should turn around and be a blessing to others who are less fortunate. Well, that's a great ethic that we're hearing in the teachings of Jesus and that we're still trying to live out 21 centuries later, right? Well, the problem between the days of Moses and the time of Jesus is that we have many conquests of the people of, of God and the land of Israel. And one of the most um, uh, impactful ones was came in the 330s B.C. Alexander the Great came from the West as a Macedonian, but he's bringing Greek culture. And along with that Greek culture, he brings the idea of urbanization. People are moving from the farms into these large, sprawling, new, modern Greek cities that are popping up all over the place. And so with the, with the increase in urbanization, with leaving many people leaving their ancestral farms, and with the rise of a sort of a middle class that were artisans, blacksmiths, and shoemakers, and uh, salesmen, businesses are popping up all over the place, trade is increasing and the like, then uh, you have people who are making their living not by farming, not on their family farms, but rather in other ways. And so they don't have a field to leave a crop. They're not sowing seed. They don't reap a harvest. And yet we can't say, well, then none of this is relevant anymore. I, I, I guess God's Word doesn't speak to us in our generation. Well, actually it does because the principle that is encoded in these passages is that those of us who have, have a responsibility to help people out who periodically find themselves in need. That's already coded there in the Law of Moses. We don't have to wait to Jesus. We don't have to wait to Paul. We don't have to wait until we get to the New Testament to get that kind of teaching. People have a responsibility. We live in a culture. We live in a society. We live in a community. And as we are blessed, we have the opportunity then to bless other people with, um, who are experiencing uh, difficulties from time to time. And so we already see within the, 
uh, the Bible itself, there's an interpretive process that's going on that says, okay, not everybody's a farmer anymore. Not everybody has a crop that they can then leave behind part of so that people like Ruth could come along and glean in the fields of Boaz, but we still do have the blessing of God on us and we still have enough for ourselves and enough to be a blessing to other people who find themselves in need from time to time. Right? So what Jesus is doing is He is assuming that there is a connection between the laws of gleaning and the practice of almsgiving. And I think that that's an important kind of a, a, almost a springboard for us to deal with the fact that our situations, technology and culture and what, language and what have you, is going to change from time to time. But these basic foundational principles that are encoded in God's Word, sometimes in our agricultural laws and the like, still have an um, eternal rev- relevance to us as the people of God today. Um, all we've got to do is scratch just a little bit. All we've got to do is a little bit of work in order to get at those eternal truths. We even get this in the, uh, uh, this idea of righteousness um, being code for almsgiving or benevolent giving from Paul. It's not just in Jesus. Watch what Paul does in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 5 through 9. Paul says, I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift. Notice that there's a gift going on, something that is being given from one person to another uh, without expectation of return. God loves a cheerful giver, gift and giver. That always you may have an abundance for every good deed, as is written. Now watch what Paul does. He quotes from Psalm 112. He scatters abroad. He gave to the poor. That person's righteousness abides. The person who who gives to the poor, his righteousness abides forever. That word righteousness, Paul is interpreting the same way that Jesus interpreted it. And that is a reference to benevolent giving, the Hebrew tzedakah. And so that person who gives to the poor, that act of tzedakah abides forever. It's a memorial forever, written in the books for good for him uh, in eternity. So a really interesting um, example of terminology that's being used by Jesus is being used in the same way um, in the letters of Paul. Now, there's another passage further down into chapter 6 where Jesus is still, he's going to return to the, the, this important idea of giving, helping out those who find themselves in periodic need. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures, and this is important language, laying up treasure. That's more code. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. I'm underlining these words because they're going to come into play when we look at the works of the rabbis. Don't lay up treasures for yourself where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves, people can steal, break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't break in and steal because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What exactly is Jesus talking about here? We get this passage from the second century the early 2nd century B.C., probably around the time of 200 B.C., maybe at the, at the very latest, 180 B.C. The uh, text is Ben Sira. Some people know of that as the book of Ecclesiasticus. It was written between Malachi and Matthew, almost perfectly in between. And this is what Ben Sira says, Lose your silver, uh, you could translate this word money, You lose your money for the sake of a brother or a friend and do not let it rust under a stone uh, and be lost. Lay up treasure, same language that we get in Jesus, lay up treasure according to the commandments of the Most High. So evidently from Jesus, Ben Sira, more than 200 years before him, the idea of laying up treasure has to do with that giving of tzedakah. That act of benevolent doing, tzedakah, is an act of benevolent giving. 
but lay up treasure according to the commandments of the Most High. In other words, Ben Sira is already in 200 BC, and this is over a hundred years after the conquest of Alexander the Great, Hellenism and urbanization. He's already seeing the idea of almsgiving, which is he's using the language of laying up treasure as code for almsgiving, just like tzedakah or righteousness is code for almsgiving. And he's already seeing it as being fulfilling the commands of the Most High, those commandments that are given in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy in the Torah. And it will profit you more than gold. Store up almsgiving. Bam! There it is, right in black and white. Well, all white. So here, store up almsgiving, laying up treasure. These are synonymous. They mean the same thing. See how easy this is? This, this is not rocket science at all. Store up almsgiving in your treasury, and there it will rescue you from all affliction. Let's go to the work of the rabbis now. So we're looking at a time just before Jesus and now a time just after Jesus. There was a king whose name was Monobaz, and he was the king of a, of a country called Adiabene, which had become thoroughly Judaized. The, the, the entire country, including its royalty, had converted to Judaism. This is in a time in the middle of the first century when Monobaz was the king of Adiabene. He went and gave to the poor from his treasures during the years of famine. He said, my ancestors laid up treasures, same language used by Ben Sira, same language used by Jesus. He, my ancestors laid up treasures where the human hand cannot reach. In other words, it, they can't be stolen. But I have laid up treasures above where the human hand cannot reach, can't be stolen. It's the same language that Jesus is using. Don't lay up treasures on earth where moth uh, can, uh, can, uh, can rust, where, where moth can consume and rust can destroy, but lay up treasures in heaven where thieves can't steal, where thieves can't break in and steal. So Monobaz is saying, just as it stated, righteousness, there's your word tzedakah, righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Psalm, 1, Psalm 89. I have laid up treasures, used by Jesus, used by Ben Sirah. I have laid up treasures for myself. As is stated, it will be righteousness, tzedakah, uh, for you before the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 24. It, really interesting passage there. I have laid up treasures for myself in the world to come. As is stated, your righteousness, or your tzedakah, will go before you, Isaiah 58. And again, you've got to have a Bible passage in order to play this uh, game, to engage in um, discussion on biblical matters. Now, there's one more thing that I wanted to share with you. <laughs> it has to do with a passage toward the end of Matthew chapter 6. It's an extension of that part that we were just looking at, laying up treasures in heaven, meaning giving alms, giving benevolently, okay? And Jesus is going to say, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear or it's good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So in the previous verses, we're talking about laying up treasure, where um, uh, moth can't consume, and rust can't destroy, and thieves can't break in and steal. And he's talking about almsgiving. Well, now he seems to be morphing to make sure that you're not lusting after uh, other people, people of the opposite sex. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, then your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. But then in the next verse, he says, no one can serve two masters, for he'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold on to the one and he'll despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. I know that the translations read, this is an Aramaic word of obscure origin. Um, it has to do with, uh, with, rich, with money. 
the problem is that it's not an Aramaic word, it's a Hebrew word. Um, it shows up all over the place in Hebrew literature. And it doesn't just mean money, it means possessions. So what, what Jesus is saying is you can't serve God in possessions. My question is this, if in the passage before, uh, Matthew, uh, Jesus says in, in Matthew 6, lay up treasures on, in, in heaven. Um, and, and he's talking about almsgiving. Then he morphs over to the eye is the lamp of the body, and if it's good, then your whole body will be full of light. So he morphs to something having to do with lusting. But then in verse 24, he goes back to this business of money and possessions. Is Jesus kind of skipping topics around? Is he confused? Is he disorganized? Um, almost like um, some early scholars suggested some aspect of schizophrenia. Like you can't, you can't maintain a, a proper thought flow. Well, I think what we need to do is we need to look at this problematic passage. The, the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is clear, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your body will be full of darkness. I think we need to look at that, that in its original context. So take a look at this. In the book of Proverbs, we're already getting in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, he who has a bountiful or a generous eye, literally a good or a sound eye, and I'm going with the King James because the modern translations kind of um, make this less clear than it should be. Then he will be blessed because he gives of his bread to the poor. Really clear that the person who has a, a sound eye gives to the poor. This goes right along with our teaching on tzedakah, on the giving of alms as, a, as an extension of leaving the edges of your, uh, of your harvest unmowed and um, leaving behind the forgotten sheaf for the poor, the widow, the, uh, the uh, orphan, and the alien. All right, so um, here we have a Bible passage that talks about a sound eye, a good eye is one who has a benevolent or a generous eye and gives to the poor, looks upon that person kindly as opposed to sternly. <clears throat> Here's another text, and this one almost reads like a dictionary definition. I mean, it's very clear what we've got going on here. In the um, uh, uh, Midrash that's called Shira Shirim Rabbah, in the Hebrew of the rabbis, I'm not writing this. This was in the text, in this Midrash text. In the Hebrew of the rabbis, that would be as opposed to the Hebrew of the Bible, the Old Testament, um, or the, the, the Torah. In the Hebrew of the rabbis, donating generously can be referred to as donating with a good or a sound eye. I mean, the proof is in the pudding right here, guys. When Jesus is talking about if your eye is good or sound, what this text is telling us is this refers to donating generously. It, this refers to tzedakah or almsgiving, elemosunes in Greek. So th this is just perfect. I mean, I couldn't have found a better passage in rabbinic literature because it looks like almost like a dictionary definition. Here's another text from the rabbis. Rabbi, Yo Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, one may give the cup of blessing, when you're doing a, a, a um, sacramental uh, dinner, a cup of blessing to someone who's uh, to recite the blessing after the meals who has a good eye. The only person that's supposed to bless the cup is one who has a good eye. That is a generous person. As it is said, now watch how this is good eye is defined. One who has a good eye will be blessed for he gives his bread to the poor. And the quote there is from the book of Proverbs. It's beautiful. Good eye, sound eye, means someone who is a generous person. Here's another text. I want you to note that now we're going to look at the other side. We talked about a good or a sound eye, meaning someone who's generous. How about one who has a, a bad or an evil eye and is stingy? Do we have proof for that? And the survey says, yes, we do. Beginning with the Torah of Moses, beginning with the Bible itself. Hebrew reads, beware lest there's a base thought in any of your heart saying, 
The seventh year is coming. The year of remission is near. And your eye is hostile. That's the NASB, the New American Standard. But the King James says your eye is evil toward your brother. The Hebrew word there is ra, and it means bad, unhealthy, or evil. And your eye is bad, unhealthy, or evil toward your poor brother. And you give him nothing. Then he may cry out to Yahweh against you, and it will be sin in you. It's all about giving. It has to do this business of having a, an eye that is not sound, as Jesus says. An eye that is evil, an eye that is bad, has to do with someone who is miserly or stingy and not willing to give to the one who, who is in need. And you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you. Here's another rabbinic text. There are four kinds of charity givers. The one who wishes to give but doesn't want other people to give, that person's eye is bad. Notice it has to do with giving. It has to do with giving. That person's eye is bad who begrudges other people jumping in and saying, hey, yeah, I can help out as well. Then he who wishes that other people should give but that he himself should not give, that person's eye is also raw bad, evil, or stingy, or, or miserly. So really clear what we're getting from, the, from the, the early rabbinic stuff from before, during, and after the time of Jesus that this good eye, bad eye is a very idiomatic way of saying generous versus stingy in terms of giving. Here's another one. Through what do blemishes come? through an evil or a bad or a stingy eye. It's the same word. It's the eye that is ra, bad. Rabbi Yitzchak says, It is customary in the world for a man to say to his fellow, Lend me your pickaxe so that I can chop this wood. And if he replies to him, I don't have one, it is because the person has a bad, evil, or stingy. That word ra has a bad, evil, or stingy eye. So he says, so, so by your life, lend me your sieve. Okay, if you won't lend me your pickaxe, then let me borrow your sieve. And, and, he, and the person has one, but instead says, I don't have one. It is due to an evil, bad, stingy, evil, raw eye. Immediately a blemish comes to his house. It hurts him, hurts the reputation of his family. It hurts the poor person who doesn't help get help when he when he needs it. So this idea of tzedakah, very, very um, idiomatic, very, um, it's a, a, a turn of the phrase, an expression that is popular to refer to giving to those in need, tzedakah. Beware of practicing your tzedakah before men. And so also this idea of the, the bad eye and, and the good or sound eye. Um, the sound, eye that is sound and the eye that is not sound. Very idiomatic, very figurative in terms of its um, use in the first century, in the Hebrew language, in the land of Israel. Um, you put that together and you get, it's really important for us to have a benevolent eye, to have a healthy eye, to have a proper outlook toward those who are in need. It is unhealthy for us and for the person in need to have a miserly or a stingy uh, attitude or eye. So Jesus then we can see is very much in tune with the needs of His world. He's very much in tune with the language of His world. He's very much in tune even with the idiomatic expressions or the figures of speech. Uh, that are used in his current day. He's not living outside of society. He's not living above the world. He is fully engaged in this business of in interacting with humanity. Um, and that is a beautiful aspect of the incarnation. The Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. He's also hitting people right where they live. He's not talking beneath them, condescending. He's not talking above them in ways that they can't understand, but He's relating to them right where they are in a language that they can easily understand. For us, 2,000 plus years later, different culture, different language, uh, different economy, different kinds of technology and stuff. Sometimes we have to paddle a little bit harder against the current in order to get to the essence of what Jesus is saying. 
I'm going to suggest to you that this whole endeavor is very much worth it because every time that we discover something about Jesus, we see His greatness, we see His creativity, we see His beauty in an even greater way ourselves, and we're challenged by it. The more clear that we are able, the clearer that we are able to ascertain, to understand God's Word, the more powerfully His Spirit can uh, act, can work on us using that Word to prune us, purify us, challenge us, encourage us, enable us, equip us to be His light bearers. And so as you and I continue in this quest for that original situation in which Jesus spoke and understand His words more clearly, I'm trusting that God is going to use that clearer word to challenge all of us to walk more closely to Him to draw closer to Him, for Him to empower us to live the way He's called us to live. As you pursue that, God bless you richly in it, and may you have a powerful impact on the world around you. We'll see you next time when we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount.